John, how are you? <laughs> Caught you there. <laughs> hey, Gary. How are you? How are you doing? I'm good, mate. I can't believe it's been a year. A year? A year. Oh, wow. It seems like a couple of minutes ago we were walking in that door. I you know. telling me this is the first day, the first live. First video. First video. Uh -huh. I went, wow. So here, we're back again. I know. It's you it's me again. It's grew a bit since then. Um, <laughs> and I, do you know, we obviously spoke about you coming back on. I get so many questions for people about the football agent world. See, when I done the first episode before you came on and then after you came on, and when I said you were back in this week, folk are obsessed with it. It's like, a, I don't know, obviously with football you can know everything at Players Day and you see them. You don't really know what agents do. You know a bit of it, but you don't see all of it. But you must get a lot of stuff fired at you all the time as well. Aye. On a regular basis, you know, when you especially you meet somebody right. and they say, oh, what do you do? And you say you're a football agent. Then it's like, oh, tell us a wee bit about the first thing is who do you represent? <laughs> what are the players like? Right. You know, what really happens? And Aye. and it take you about a month sitting with them just to get even to scratch your surface, Aye. Gary, you know. Exactly. So there's a lot more in the background in this business than what people really, mm -hmm. really think. And for me, you know, over the years I've been advocating, I've been trying to educate people and and get people into understanding what it's all about because right. there's a lot more to it than just seeing that final transfer deadline right. day and the guy coming in and making a lot of money. There's a lot more right. to it than well, that. That's all people see in it. It's just the the big multi million moves and the the glamour. Aye, the, all that agent's getting twenty million out of that deal. So if I do that job, I'll be I'll be quid in, in a couple of months. I'll Still not get twenty million out of one yet. <laughs> I'll chuck it after a year. <laughs> um, so I thought we'd, we'd make it a wee bit different this time. And I'll try and can I base my questions around things that people have asked and asking you about experiences that you've had as well. And we'll, we'll, can sure. I, we'll go through that. Sure. So one thing that somebody had said to me, and it was more in the sense of, obviously when you, you see an agent and they have players, etc., but it takes a long time to get there. From your point of view, You've run courses for people who want to be agents. You've been in the industry for so long. How long do you take, or how long do you think it takes for somebody to kind of get themselves established? Because a lot of people look at it as a quick one to go in and oh, I'll sign that player and it'll be fine. But from your experience, how long do you think it takes for somebody to kind of keep working away, keep networking and try and get into that that space of being an agent? It's a great question, Gary. We obviously, you know that we uh, we have we educate people through our, our online platforms, mm -hmm. and obviously we mentor people, and and we've seen hundreds and in fact thousands of people have done our courses worldwide, uh, and it's, and they ask, look, before I do this, right. will, will I be a millionaire next year? <laughs> <laughs> Wish that was the case. But on average, you know, some you get some real quick starters, and mm -hmm. we've had people who have who have done deals, good deals in the first year, and but that's amazing. Right. Uh, and if I took an average, if somebody has a real good dash at it and puts a full time effort into it, you know, and they could be in, in within three years mm -hmm. then doing deals at decent levels. Aye. Uh, to get to the the pinnacle, it's, it's at least five years. Or, or to get to a top level, just like any any Aye. industry. But uh, we have had people, you know, we had a young boy down down in uh, down in near Dorset, Weymouth in Dorset, and he uh, he started in in. They set the head on fire and and they left his job and right. he's now working full time with us. So, uh, everybody's different, but I have to tell you, you need it. You need at least a two or three year run in, to, mm -hmm. I think, before you can get properly established because there's mm -hmm. a lot of background hard work to be done, Gary. Do you think that puts a lot of people off because they don't realise that it isn't just a quick job? It is something you need to graft it, and obviously you need to gain the trust of players as well. If they're going to join yeah. up with you, then takes time. Aye. But you have people who already have got trust with players. Mm -hmm. We've had other guys who have worked with them in different areas. Aye. And uh, they trust them and they get a, a good head start. Mm -hmm. But it does it does take time. And when, if somebody says to us, look, okay, well, I want to start this program Aye. or try to learn how to be an agent, mm -hmm. when the very first thing we say is, stop, it's not a get-rich-quick scheme. Mm -hmm. It's something you really need to put a lot of time and Aye. effort. As I say, I've been doing it for nearly 29 years. I'm still mm -hmm. learning and Aye. trying to put effort uh, into it every day, putting a lot of effort into it every day. So it's not a get-rich-quick scheme, but if you do put enough effort into it mm -hmm. uh, and with the right education and the right knowledge, it's worked for a lot of people Aye. that we have that we have introduced into the business. Well, that's what I was curious about as well, because obviously the, the courses are there. 
who's probably been your best example of somebody coming through that course and kind of making a name for themselves? Well, there's a few, Gary. There's a few that I, I, I need to think about that, but maybe one that springs to mind is a boy in Manchester who uh, who approached me at a, a Manchester United Man City under 16s game. Just came straight up to me. Aye. Quite brash, you know. And I could see him coming towards me. I said, I thought he was going to, I thought he was going to hit me the way he came up to me, you know. <laughs> but basically, uh, he he told me that, he, you know, he, he loves football. He wants to be an agent. I know you're an agent, John. You're a friend of a friend, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I, I took him on board. But he, he had a real hard time. He had a mortgage business and it was going down mm. down the tubes. And, and then, then he put a lot of effort in. And this guy really worked at it. Mm. Really, really worked at it. So we supported him. He had ups and downs. People were telling him, what are you doing? You you know, why, why are you becoming the football agent? You know, it takes a lot of time and effort to get there. And uh, then he got his first wee deal. And then we helped him. And then the next thing I knew, I was sitting in a boardroom with him hey. in Birmingham. And he's like, I can't believe this. This has only been about 15 months. And now I'm doing a deal in Birmingham. Alan McLeish was the manager so long ago. Hey. But anyway, subsequently, this guy's become a millionaire. And they... Uh, no, I'm phoning him and saying, <laughs> what players have you got, you know? And he's took a player to Manchester United, he's took players to uh, lots of different clubs abroad. Mm-hmm. And But that guy has really worked at it, you know, Aye. morning, noon and night. So uh, he's one that sticks out for me. I Aye. mean, we're doing our courses. He's a guy that we introduce to people. We say, mm-hmm. right, you tell him about Aye. the ups and the downs and he'll tell him about, mm-hmm. you know, he's had great highs. Aye. But he's had lots of times where, you know, been really low and Aye. he's had to put in the time and the effort. But that's one he's he sticks out with me. His name's Laddie. He's an interesting Laddie. boy. That's good. And that's space of time as well. He's a millionaire. Yeah, he's a millionaire. He he uh, uh, and he's got gr- lots of good, uh, really good players. Mm-hmm. And he's got a good niche of players where he came from in, in the Manchester United, Manchester City setups and he went to all the youth games and, and then put in the effort. So good on him. What's your average working week? Give me, give me the hours. Jesus, you know, <laughs> average working week. You know, my, my kids my kids think that, um, you know, Zooms and phones at, at midnight or 11 o'clock at night, that's just normal to them, you Aye. know. They're putting them into the bed saying, right, go on into bed because I've got a Zoom. Aye. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not been unknown for me to, you know, getting up doing a call at half seven in the morning and still at it at midnight, mm-hmm. especially during the transfer window. There's a lot of preparation prior Aye. to that. So it's, but somebody says I want to be an agent. Mm-hmm. Don't think it's, it's a nine to five and clocking Aye. off. Aye. It's a vocation. Aye. Aye. So I, I would be about at least six hours, 56 hours still just now. Aye. And that's me sort of trying to slow down a bit. That's you 29 years in. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it as well, to be fair. That's what I was going to ask. Do you still enjoy it as much as you did when you started? I tell you what, I enjoy probably more than anything else is, is teaching people how to do it as well. Mm-hmm. You know, because it, it's great when you do a deal, you, but you've done so many, supposedly you're doing your first podcast, and, you know, and you're excited and things, mm-hmm. and then once you've done thousands of them, it becomes natural. That's Aye. the way it is with myself. Uh, and I don't mean that in a blase sense. Mm-hmm. I still appreciate the fact I'm even in this business. Aye. But when I get that type of guy phoning me and saying, John, I've got a deal, we're going mm-hmm. to Birmingham's boardroom, you know, I get a buzz out Aye. of, of, of showing people the, the knowledge that I've gained over mm-hmm. the over the twenty nine years. I had the mistakes. Because I've, I've made plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to them. <laughs> we'll get to them. Um so I'm gonna concentrate on on your career, obviously. Twenty nine years, lots of highs, lots of lows I can imagine as well. Um the first thing I wanted to ask you, obviously, you you started off with a lot of UK based players, but as any agent would probably say, it, there's such a big world out there now and players are, are everywhere. What are some kind of memories for you of going abroad or, or trying to get overseas players or things that kind of stick in your mind? Because I would imagine there's some countries where it's a minefield to try and sign players and get them back here. And No, there is. Uh, I know that when I first started to try and crack Brazil, uh, which is over 10 years ago, or more than that, and that was through that was helped through Craig Moore, who works mm-hmm. with now. He introduced us to people in in, in Brazil, and uh, and I thought, wow, this is great. Went to, went there, seen the players everywhere we went. We were led into VIP areas by the clubs because of the connections. It was mm-hmm. like a dream. Aye, watching unbelievable players going to all these different stadiums and uh, all over Brazil, 
And I thought, wow, this is, we've cracked it here. Aye. But until you find out that <laughs> when you go in to sign up a player in Brazil, there's about five agents round about them. <laughs> there's their parents that, that look after them. There's somebody at the club. There's their cousin. There's their pal. And, and to, to dig deep in to get a deal done. And just the different way they operate is very, mm -hmm. very difficult in that right. country. It still is. So when people say to me, hey, there's great players in Brazil. I'm going to go and try there. I said, stop. Come on, talk to me for a couple of hours and I'll tell you the, the do's and the don'ts. So that was somewhere I thought because the talent is so good mm -hmm. and because I had access to it, that would be easy. But it wasn't, Gary. I had to, and it's still a difficult place because there's so many people into one particular player when you go and try, right. trying to sign. You've got that dual ownership and stuff, haven't you? And dual ownership. And then you've, there's always... I don't think I've ever done a deal with a Brazilian where it's only just me and the player. Somebody turns up somewhere. Aye. Like a bad penny, you know. We done it, and one thing I went to do a deal during the Premiership years ago, and it was only me, the player's agent, and the player. And then all of a sudden, on the day, mm -hmm. on the day of the deal getting done, another two agents turned up saying they represented the player, and it was a disaster. What do you do in that situation? Cry. <laughs> <laughs> we lost the deal. We lost the deal in that one, and. I had to all set up, travel to Brazil, came back and got the player over and then the club and the club scene was so many people involved and it was it wasn't correct and they just said I think we'll we'll leave us for right. now. We'll maybe revisit that in six months and they never revisit that. That would basically an excuse to say this is a mess. Is that just when agents kinda overseas just attach themselves to young prospects and get them to sign? Yes. And then there's more than one and it just becomes a bit Yes. It's I found a lot, of, as well, we found the same problem down in Africa where what happens is, you know, you're a really good young talent and all mm -hmm. these agents jump on you and these guys sign a lot of contracts through ignorance, you know, thinking, Aye. oh, you taking care of me in the UK, mm -hmm. you're taking care of me in, in somewhere in, in uh, France and you're doing it right. in Germany. And then, you know, it's a bit messy because they've maybe signed a contract that they don't really know what they're signing. And, and because they're so talented, there's a lot of money involved. It mm -hmm. becomes It becomes a nightmare. Uh, and a lot of it's down to the uh, the player not being educated enough at age 17 or 18 Aye. and signing contracts with lots of different people. Uh, mm -hmm. As they go on in time, they realise that's not the way to do things. Aye. But So that, that's normally what happens, especially, as you could understand, if there's, if there's a lot of money involved and he looks as somebody who's going to go to Real Madrid in the future, Aye. you could imagine how many people are around about this talent, whether it be in... Africa or Brazil or whatever. I always think of the Mascarano and Tevez. Yeah, that's the one situation. everybody's thinking about. And there was about. like five agents. That's right. And they all wanted like four million each. <laughs> and I think the clubs were like, hold on a minute, what is actually happening here? It still happens. It's, it's a bit more regulated now because, you know, people are got more educated about signing contracts. But, you know, back 20 years ago, the Wild West is, a, is the least uh, you can say when you're going to these countries. Do you get clubs, but that just refuse to deal with these situations? Like... Because they must just be like, this is too... No, that's what happened in that, that particular Aye. case. I'm telling you, this man, listen, guys, this is too much. Because uh, they were arguing Aye. outside the ground and, and people were saying, I want in. And I'm like, what's happening here? And, and then we said, right, we'll come, back, we'll come back in a couple of days, calm it down, but didn't. People would sit, want to send lawyers and ended up a deal didn't get done. And, and that was a learning process for myself. Aye, that must said, be your worst nightmare as oh, an agent. You, you think a deal's getting done and... <laughs> Then it's the door goes, <laughs> and the next thing the three agents come running in, and you're like, "No, didn't happen." But the learning, what, what I learned from that was, if I'm ever taking anybody to a club again, mm -hmm. is to be fully aware to them that we're the only agents, and I can't have any, anybody else involved uh, before we even get them on a plane. Do you get situations where the player doesn't even realise there's maybe five or six people? I have seen that as well. I've not been in a situation that they didn't realise that where these agents came from, and that case I was telling you about Gary, the, the player knew, what the, 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 but sometimes they don't know because it, a lot of them are ignorant because they, they just sign contracts Aye. thinking, oh, this guy's going to get me out of mm -hmm. my situation because that's what a lot of them are in, in especially in Africa. Mm -hmm. They're in situations where they'll sign anything just Aye. to get out to play, to get out of their poverty. Aye. And it's sad, you know. Well, that's it. It ends up being unfair on them as well because our club doesn't entertain it. They're Aye. then left sitting kind of get a move somewhere because the money's astronomical that their, right. their agents are looking for. Aye, well, in that particular case, the boy, obviously, he went back and then he he, he done okay in Brazil, so it wasn't like a, a, a horror story. Or Aye. A, a horror story for us, but for the boy, 
maybe him getting into England was something that he missed out on, you know. Very true. What about, have you ever had situations when you have been travelling abroad and, and going to see somebody and it's just been a disaster from start to finish? Going to look at a player or, or going far-flung parts of the world and it's just no, it's no work to it well at all. <laughs> I've had hundreds of them. <laughs> People think, you know, it's, it's great, you know, you're travelling to these weird and wonderful places and to do business and... I can, just, I can think of a story when I went to China once and it was a, I was recommended to go a, to see a couple of clubs in China and I mm-hmm. went to Beijing and Shanghai, but it was Beijing where I was staying. And believe it or not, it was a guy from Glasgow was in was working out there and he says, well, I know these clubs come mm-hmm. out, great, and he worked for the High Commission or something right. and I introduced to him. And, and at that time it was difficult to get into Chinese clubs. And, and so I went all the way to Beijing and uh, never been there before. And the uh, interesting place. Aye. The guy was there on hand to help me. Uh, he came round to my hotel, blah, blah, blah. But then when I was there, this is saying about going to weird and wonderful places, he said to me, you know, there's a club that are looking for, that, are going to, that have just been promoted Aye. to the Chinese Super League. Mm-hmm. And they're looking for ABC. And I thought, well, I can, I can, I can do whatever, Where is it? Aye. And he pointed on the map. I said, oh, we'll have a dash at that. <laughs> And I left, <laughs> I left the, uh, the the hotel about half five in the morning because I knew it was about a five hour trip in the train. Aye. Nice train, right? a bullet train. Aye. And I went up in the middle of nowhere. I can't even remember the name of the place because it was bizarre. <laughs> I should have known because in, on the train, no, not a person could speak English to it. I was nice, a bit weird, you know, where we were going. Get off the, the train, you know, and you think, you just don't realise, you know, where you are. Aye. And then I've got an address to go to. Nobody could speak a word of English. <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation? Maybe they, spe- they can hardly understand the Glasgow accent. Never mind try to get you, try to get it out in China. And eventually, somehow, I got to this address, and it was bizarre. It was like going up a close to meet this club. Right. And then they took me along a corridor, and then opened this door, and there must have been about twenty Chinese faces, one woman, and about nineteen guys staring, waiting for me. And I thought, well, that's a bit of here. Yeah. Yeah. But none of them could speak English. But we found a guy that could interpret. Anyhow, so I'm in this meeting. Try to talk about needing a striker and a goalkeeper right. and whatever, and we're at it. And, and, and I thought it's gone no bad, anyhow. Goes back, leaves them, shake hands, everything's good. Goes back, gets a train away back at him about 10 at night or something, absolutely shattered. And I'm thinking, where have I just been? <laughs> now, where have I been? It was bizarre. Uh, so much so that I remember writing it down. I said, No, don't believe how this what happened to you today and all the things, anyhow. And I got back, and then the club never came back to me. <laughs> And I thought, talk about travelling all around the world to try and do a deal. Oh, but so I've had I've, I've had a few of them. That was me taking an upper upper chance to to try and Aye. to try and get a. Uh, but it's a bound. cost as well because you've then got to do all that. Well, no, that's that's what people that trip to China uh, cost a few thousand pounds, and there was no business done it. And but people, people don't realise that part about Aye. the agency. You know, you're taking gambles that mm-hmm. right. I'll go and try and do business out here. And Aye. time. Effort, money, aye, and then you've came back, and then the wife's like, "Yes, how did it go? <laughs> well, have you ever heard of this place north of Beijing? Five hours. <laughs> That's wild, absolutely mental." Um, you mentioned Mister Moore, yeah. so you had Craig Moore from the get go, didn't you? From yeah. when he, he came yeah. over, and you've still he, he's an agent now. That's right. Talk me is. through that because you don't really hear about. You always see players changing agents all the time or they chop and change where if they go to clubs or whatever, but he's been to a lot of places and you've been there start to finish. How did you how did you end up with him in the first place? That's a funny story. He actually and he loves telling us, by the way, right? He uh, if he comes on your 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 show, um, he'll he'll probably tell the same story. I got introduced to him uh, when he first came to Rangers, he, he, I mean, I think he was seventeen. And I went to meet him mm-hmm. to say, right, you know, I've got a few players here and Aye. I'd like to do business with you. And, and they knocked me back, actually. Basically said, well, I don't think I need an agent just now and chased me. And he tells everybody. Wait, was it then? It was 17 or 18. <laughs> he says, I don't think I need an agent. And I'm like, right, okay. Because he just signed a contract, to be fair. Aye. Uh, and then he'd like, I've just signed a contract. Would I want an mm-hmm. agent for it? But I'm trying to say, well, it's no, more than just a contract. Aye. It's about your next move, leading into it, and mm-hmm. marketing you and being there with somebody. Because... 
he'd, he'd nobody here. His parents yeah. were back in Australia. Mm -hmm. So subsequently, we get to him again a second time, and he, he, he says, right, I think uh, uh, about six months later, after he got to know us, and, and he signed. And Craig became like a son to himself. Uh, mm -hmm. and he was only 18 at the time, and his parents, I say, were, were obviously in Australia. And uh, looked after him throughout his full career from... From uh, from Rangers to Crystal Palace, Aye. back to Rangers. Aye. Then where did we go from uh, from there? Borussia München Gladbach was it? Borussia München Gladbach, and then took him to a place called Kavala in Greece, which was bizarre. Uh, Newcastle. Aye, he got, he played under Graham Souness at, at Newcastle, which is another interesting story. And uh, what do you call it? He he uh, he's been a, a stalwart and mm. uh, we odds in our business. Aye. Great guy. Does his business the same as what he was like on the pitch? Mm -hmm. You know, honest, hard working, Aye. straightforward. No nonsense. It's the way he is Aye. in business. And then he left, when he left here, we, his final job I'd done for him was to take him back to Brisbane Roar. Mm -hmm. And then at Brisbane Roar, he worked under Ange Postacoglu. Right. And Ange came in, if you know, if you do your research, get rid of him and Charlie Muller and Bob Malcolm, who happened to be all my clients. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe then, he knew, maybe he knew what Jovi was going to end up in. <laughs> uh, and people thought they'd fallen out, but they hadn't. And then and actually Ange, when he became the national team manager, brought Craig in to help him with the, the player liaison type right. thing, which was a great so that's how much he respected Aye. Craig. Uh, and then Craig was working with the, the FA, and then he got a job as sporting director right. for, for Bris uh, Brisbane Roar. Right. And then during that period, he got a feel for dealing with agents and, you know, he'd seen me all Aye. my time. Uh, and just before lockdown, I was, he was like, really have a go at this. I said, well, come on, come back. Mm -hmm. And he was itching to get back into European football, back to, back here. And of course, he lands back here and COVID came. <laughs> and our meetings were walking around <laughs> parks. <laughs> He's like, oh, you, you couldn't make us up. The only way we could meet each other was walking around the park. Uh, to be able to, uh, to do our business. Jeez. So he's working with us uh, full time and, uh, and he's doing a marvellous job. And is he, do you find it helps that he's he's been a player at the highest level? Definitely. From the point of view, I help my other players because he's, he's been there. Definitely, definitely. He's, he's mentoring the kids, you know, and uh, you know, one of the first young guys he took on the young boy at Motherwell was a centre back. Mm -hmm. And he not only is saying to him, right, okay, we'll help you go through your career. Aye. He's also saying to him, right, I watched the game tonight, maybe your positioning wasn't right, mm -hmm. or, you know, when you're going up for a header, or giving him advice about or, or, or the mistakes that he made uh, early Aye. doors, and, and giving, giving him, you know, great confidence about how to how to become a professional football player. Mm -hmm. And you can't buy that from somebody who's no. done it. Even as an agent, I, you know, you're trying to talk players through, but would rather listen to somebody that's played at the highest, Aye. Uh, the highest level. Well, so, I suppose he's walked in the shoes as well, hasn't he? He's done it. He's, he's done it. If you remember when he was at Rangers, uh, he was getting a real hard time. Uh, Aye. He played he played right back when his a, first game. And he was never a right Aye, back. Aye, he was a centre back. He's a he, centre back. That was under Walter Smith, I Walter, remember it. Walter remember played it him at well. right back and the fans were giving him a lot of stick. But then he got into centre back and started doing okay. Uh, and then Crystal Palace came in for him. Aye. Uh, Terry Venables. Terry right. loved him because Terry was a manager. He was Australian manager, That's wasn't right. He? And he loved them. Aye. And then Dick came in. Dick was no, we need to keep him, but we'd already agreed uh, to go to right. to Crystal Palace. Uh, and then of course they went bust. Aye. And then Craig came back within a year. You know, if you remember that. Because then when he came back, he was he was the centre back. And he was, he was the guy. He was there. And he done all well. the time. He done oh, well. He was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. So he's been he's been a he's seen everything in the game mm -hmm. from you know starting what it's like to come, especially come away from Australia himself at age sixteen. Mm -hmm. Nobody here. And then he uh, goes through that whole journey mm -hmm. of all those different clubs, different Aye. countries, the Bundesliga. People don't realise he played with Borussia Mönchengladbach. Uh, you know, played in uh, for the, in the Premier League for Aye. Newcastle. Played in a wild place called Kavala. Uh, and obviously played in Australia and, and, and Rangers. So Aye. having all that experience can on, could only help him with players. And mm. then the fact that he worked for the national team. Aye. And as a sports director, so he's seen it all. He's seen right. it. He's seen everything. So uh, when we were talking about it, it was great for to get him back. And I keep saying to people when he comes to meetings, me, I can't get rid of him. But he says the other way around, <laughs> I can't get rid of this this wee guy. <laughs> it's a full end to end, isn't it? Because it's yeah. somebody that's come in at the start and then 
they're actually part of the agency now. No. They, they've they've worked with you as a client and know they're the actual person that's getting players in the door. Yeah. And he's very good at it as well. No, I was got to say, if that's not a success story, I don't know what it is. Um, go to Ash, and I'm, you'll be no be surprised when you say there's a fat boy agent coming on in Glasgow. The, the, the two names that spring up are ask him about Rangers and Celtic, ask him about players he's had, ask him about the dramas. Is it a see for players maybe more coming in for abroad and maybe players here as well? Even as an agent, is it just a goldfish bowl for these guys when that when they're in that environment? You even believe it, you know. It, it, of course, you, you, there's no situation where if you see a, a Celtic or a Rangers player in a pub or or you see them in a restaurant or you even see them walking down the street, mm -hmm. they don't get any peace. Aye. It's and I've been in situations with players in other countries. Aye, and then they come here and they go, "Wow!" They go, <laughs> "What is this?" And then they talk about Manchester, mm -hmm. they talk about London, uh, and then they talk about, you know, Brazil or top, uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, or, right. or you're talking about Germany. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been in these places with these famous footballers, and they've walked down the street, and they've been, you know, some people maybe look or have a wee swatch. Right. But if you walk down the street, street of Glasgow or in a restaurant or go anywhere in public, mm -hmm. then you're it's a different animal altogether. Right. Uh, and they get a wee bit of shock, so especially the ones that come from abroad. You know, mm -hmm. they've, they've been told, Aye. you know, this is a goldfish bowl, watch where you go, what you're doing, and they go, ah, it's okay, you know, I used mm -hmm. to play for whoever. Aye. They get here and they go, oh, what's happening here? Yeah, and it's just because of the crazy enthusiasm of the Glaswegians Aye. who just love the football. 100%. And they either love you, you can down the street, Aye. or... Oh, you, you big prick. Aye. You know, you're either getting... You're or the bay fate, you. <laughs> depends how well you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good point. I've had that as well. Oh, you're rubbish. But you're self support No, no. <laughs> yeah. Have uh, you had players, though, that, have, that that you've had signed to you and they've come in, and not even so much the, the fans in that environment, but just that expectation of you need to win? all the time because obviously you play for all these big clubs but the pressure on they two is intense and a lot of players probably come up you see a lot of players come up for England and they just look as if they're duck out of water they're just no. like after I'm completely lost here but have you found that for taking players? I'll take it the other way I took a player from Celtic mm -hmm. to Middlesbrough right and they uh, and I wasn't at his debut which was quite unusual but I wasn't at one of his first games mm -hmm. and he was telling me it was Two each, right? With Middlesbrough against Leeds or something, mm -hmm. with twenty minutes to go, and he's charging about, you know, trying to get that third goal, going crazy and, Aye. like you know, and sweating. And they're like, "Wow, oh, calm!" He's a centre back. Aye. Calm down, what are you doing? Two each is good, you know, Aye. against Leeds. It's like, because he'd been brought up where it would have been Celtic or Rangers, whatever. Aye. You've got to win. Right. So it's just in your DNA. But these other guys from next to him are going. Yeah, then this is good. <laughs> Two each, and he, he's like, and then after he was explaining to him, we went for a beer, and he's like, "Where, where, I, where I was? We had to win every game, Aye. no matter who it was. If it was it, if you're Celtic or Rangers, you're playing tiddlywinks against Aye. somebody, you've got to win. Aye. And that's just the mentality that's inbred uh, with Celtic Rangers. But lots of other countries, it's no definitely no like that, and especially Aye. you know, people surprise you in England as well. You know, they've not got that same. Nah, there's I've been to a few games down south, and it's. It's no get that intensity. No chance. At all. Like, you go to games here and after 10 minutes, the crowd are... See if it's nil nil. nothing might have happened in the game and somebody missed a chance and you're like, here we go. And you just <laughs> hear the... Feel sorry for young players because it's sink or swim for, oh, no. for both of them. Well, you could go back to Craig Muir on that one because uh, Craig was getting a lot of stick at right back and Aye. he could hear everything. Aye. So, to be able to get through that, Gary, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's a must psycho psychologically. Mm -hmm. How you get through that is, you know, and I can't, you can't be on the pitch and do that for them. No. But, you know, you've got to tell them it's happened to so many people who have maybe stick or the fans on your back, especially here in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to get over that mentality. Aye. Do you consider that, though? See, if you have get a player and maybe Celtic or Rangers are trying to sign them, do you sometimes look at a player and, and have that conversation of, I don't know if you're ready for this? Or, Definitely. Aye. How is that, man? Because that must be an awkward... Because a player must just hear... One of the two clubs and think, right, I'm I'm in, but it's then your job to go, this okay. isn't as easy as you think it's going to be. Could you handle this? That's what I said. Can, can you handle? They go, oh, we're playing at a decent level. 
but it's different. Right. And they uh, asking that question, you know, them, or even, you know, the people around about them. A lot mm -hmm. of times we don't know them so well, which through a broker we're bringing them to, to Celtic Rangers. But you know, one of the biggest things is you've got to do your research whether they've got the men the, the mentality. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact that maybe Celtic Rangers have looked at really good players, but thought I don't think they can handle that. No, no, it's normal. I would, I would crack. <laughs> Not a chance. Obviously, you've had a lot of Rangers players. But you're a Celtic fan. That's right, aye. Has it ever... No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say impacted because obviously you're professional and you do your job, but has it ever come up in conversation? Or have you ever... Obviously, I'd imagine there's always banter in Glasgow if people find out what team you support and vice versa, but you must have got a bit of abuse for Rangers players over the years and vice you, versa. I've, I've, had, I've had a few scenarios uh, because uh, I look after Rangers players. Mm -hmm. And it, I remember... I remember um, going way back and Charlie Muller, I was looking after, had just uh, broke into the first team. Mm -hmm. And Charlie, you know, like, was Aye. wonderful, a like, fantastic player. Even Paul Gascoigne said to me, you know, that's the best young player I've ever played alongside. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would, would maybe not know that. And I remember we were all, uh, at those days used to go drinking on a Sunday. Aye. <laughs> and uh, I was with Craig Moore and, and Charlie and I think my Barry was there. I can't remember, but it was about... Three or four of my players, and I'm sitting drinking, and it was the old school, mm -hmm. McCoy's, Durant, and a few of the other ones, and they, we Durant, he's always got a wee bit of patter, you know, he was like, oh, wee man. I'm like, I went, have I just heard that you're a Tim? <laughs> I went, oh, here we go. I just laughing, the boys like, oh, Johnny's great, he's your agent and Aye. all that. I'll ask you a question, he says, what would happen if next week, in fact, two weeks time for now, we're in the, the, the Celtic Rangers of the semi-final of the League Cup. Charlie's playing. Who do you want? Charlie's playing and Craig's playing and Barry's playing. <laughs> who do you want to win? And I'm like, oh, how do you answer this? You know, no worry, eyes are on me. I says, that's easy. I says, I want Charlie to score a hat-trick and Celtic to one four three. All the players are updated. Yeah, we bass on. It's all good banter. So I've never, I've never really had many problems because... I didn't treat any of them any different. It was a professional job for me. Mm -hmm. And it still is. Right. Whether you're black, white, yellow, Catholic, Protestant, and if I represent you, mm -hmm. I'm putting my heart and soul in to help you right. uh, to get to the level where you're at. And I remember David Murray saying to me, you know, John, maybe you're putting that wee bit extra effort in because of Rangers guys, you know, and I remember him saying that to me. So uh, for me, it didn't matter who they were. Right. I just put it up at the end. But I've had, I've had the, more than once, I've had the part about the... <laughs> Just recently, a couple of weeks ago, when a guy was talking to me, I had known for years and years, and he says to me about players, and he says, and now you're a Rangers supporter, and I went, <laughs> I said, what'd you get that for? He says, well, I just assumed that, you know, because uh, over the last 20 odd years, we've had a lot of Rangers players, and a lot of players have taken to Rangers that Aye. a lot of people uh, don't know about. Mm -hmm. I've got to ask you then, have you had a situation where a player could have went to Rangers or Celtic? A few times, a few <laughs> times. And that's been that is difficult. Aye, how do you uh, navigate that? Uh, navigate it's a good word, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> now, for me, I say, there's your two offers, or there's who, who wants you guys make a decision. Don't put that in my head, you know. Uh, no, but I've always let a player make, mm -hmm. make, I've never been one of the ones that pushes them into a club. I've always said, look, what do you think, right? Look at their football. Aye. If their money's roughly the same, and on most occasions it, it wasn't a massive differences, mm -hmm. who do you think suits you as a player? Aye. and let them make that make that decision. I've, I've been in that situation uh, more than once. But I have to tell you about when, when the Rangers won the league, this, I can't remember the year, you, you, you know better than me, uh, before Celtic started on their nine in a row. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that time I had about seven or eight of the Rangers team as, as clients, Aye. and obviously they know myself, but they won self support and they won the league. Aye. And uh, I lived in in Bordeaux at the time, and uh, we used to drink in the pubs there, the, the weekends now and again, and they won the league, and great text, congratulations, you know, to the other Switch players. Switch your phone off. Aye, <laughs> phone was off, <laughs> phone was off, and I went, Sunday afternoon, they were going out after the Saturday Aye. when they won the league, and I went, right, Sunday, I'll just go to a wee quiet pub, but never ever go to, Aye. in the lounge at the back, I don't even think they know where there's a lounge in the back of this pub, but the buggers went round all the pubs, and not interested in Bordeaux to try and find me. 
next thing. This, you know, they've been out the night before, as you could imagine. <laughs> but six or seven there, you know, I remember Kevin Muscat, I used to play Craig Moore, Barry, uh, Bob Malcolm, we Charlie, a uh, big squad, and the door kicks kicked open, right? There he's there, there the wee man there. Oh, no. So, of course, I'm getting dogs abuse and uh, we're the champions and they're having a laugh, blah, blah, blah. And, and I thought, well, there you go. That's, you know, it was all banter. Aye. But one Aye. thing I remember it will never, ever forget is I'm not going to buy a round. Right? And he says, get a round in. We're, we're uh, celebrating a drink. We've won the league. And I said, I'll get you a drink, no problem. And the lassie put it down. You know, and the lassie wasn't into football and she didn't really think she meant, and that'll be 1690. <laughs> and I thought, right, they'll wound her up. To tell her, <laughs> tell him it's sixteen ninety, but it wasn't. It was actually sixteen ninety. You couldn't make that up. So the boys always remind me about that. Remember that round you bought about twenty years ago, sixteen ninety, when we won the league. So it's just a wee bit of part. <laughs> I've never really had many, many problems with that because at both sides, the Celtic and Rangers, mm -hmm. um, I, I treat them all the same. Aye. As I say, whether it's where they're from or what the religion, it doesn't matter. I do a professional job. Aye. What about on the, the Celtic side? Who's the kind of characters that stuck out for you that you represented? There's been a few, you know. They, obviously, I brought Chris Sutton to Celtic. He's a character, obviously. Don't need to go on, but we know all about Chris and what he, he was all about. Uh, one, one, one guy I really liked uh, was Barry Robson. You right. know, Barry was at Rangers. Uh, he's a kid. Ah, he's a kid. Aye. Aye. And then I was hitting from Dundee United. Right. Uh, Dundee United to, uh, to Celtic and... And it was one of those ones that was at half eleven at night, and they had to deal had to be done at midnight, mm -hmm. and we were on back and forward on the phone, and Celtic really wanted him. And who was the manager at the time? Was it Strachan? It was Strachan. Strachan, I mean, Robson and Hartley around about the same, same time. And it was a guy at Dundee United uh, that that passed away. That owned Dundee United. Oh, Thompson. Thompson, lovely man. Aye. He says, John, I want to keep him mm -hmm. because I want to win the Scottish Cup. They were going for the Scottish Cup Aye. or something. And I said, but, you know, Eddie, the boys, the boys, you know, getting a big chance to go to a massive club. Anyway, we got it done about 10 to 12. Mm -hmm. And Barry's a character. Great guy, by the way. Aye. Good player, by the way. Aye, really a good, good player. player. You know, he should have been a lot higher. Aye. And he scored in his first kick at the ball when he, when he played uh, away uh, uh, for Celtic. And, and he came back for me and went, oh, everybody were buzzing. And then the midweek or two weeks or whatever later, he scored against Barcelona. <laughs> then he scored against Rangers. And he's on the phone saying, we man, have we got the right contract here for me? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, ah, you know, the best start you could ever get as a Celtic player. And I, I really liked him as a, a guy and a player. He's at Aberdeen now, uh, doing the youth, he did the youth team up in Aberdeen. Aye, because he was playing there for a while as well, at Aberdeen, Aye. wasn't he? Aye, he's a good player, Barry Robson. Really good player. What about the times where, you touched on it earlier with Charlie Muller, see if you've got a player who comes through young and like Charlie Muller was unbelievable as a as a kid and they start to kind of not fade away but they start to kind of standards start to go a wee bit how hard is that for your point of view because you know the potential that the players have got but you can see it kind of slipping the, the other way massively frustrating because you're looking at players like Charlie and other players that I've had and you're looking you're going wow he could go to the top right I and when he doesn't have a good game or the attitude's not right or whatever, it's not made that happen, then you begin to think, how can I help them to Aye. make that happen? Aye. Uh, so it's a wee bit frustrating. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's horrible to watch, you know? Aye. I mean, we've all had the guy that stands at the end of the bar and says, see him, he was, he's could have played with a, with a big belly. And, uh, he, but when you're actually watching a guy that's playing at a top level, thinking, right, this we've got somebody special here, mm -hmm. and you see them in back the way it's... It's uh, it's no easy. Aye. But for me, as a professional, I do everything in every shape or form from, you know, uh, mindset advice to fitness advice Aye. Uh, to working with the club to see if we can get them. Because the club want to progress. Mm -hmm. uh, I try every angle I can with these people. And unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work. I suppose as well, though, it's another thing for people to bear in mind because it's as much as you've got all the good stuff, you have got the hard conversations as well that a player probably doesn't want to hear when when you're saying to them, look, you're no, the club don't think you're working as hard or you're out drinking all the time or your standards are starting to slip. No player's going to want to hear that. No. And yet you've got to be honest, is that's your client and give him that, you've got to get us both barrels because somebody's got to tell you. 
Gary, for me, for me, think about this. Even you, even you're a decent player. Even if you have a bad game, your 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 dad and your mother and your pals all say, "Oh, you were brilliant," and all that, and and that can be detrimental. Aye. For me, when I see somebody that's not a bad game, or no good, no fit enough, or no putting the effort in, mm -hmm. I was brutally honest. Do they like it or they don't like it? So Aye. look, they're always going to say that because mm -hmm. they're attached to Aye. you, emotionally attached Aye. to you. And so am I, but I'm going to tell you, you're no fit, mm -hmm. you're not putting in the effort, your attitude's not right, and that's not easy. Aye. Man, it took me a while to learn how to do that. Aye. But they appreciate that more, because at the beginning, when I first started, I was saying, oh, you were brilliant, oh, oh, you set up that ball, but it's the only thing you've done Aye. in the whole game. Aye. You didn't track back, you weren't fast enough, you didn't put the effort in. Mm -hmm. Oh, i seen you out in the pub on Thursday night when you should have been in the pub. I blah, brilliant. But then I'd begin to realise, I'm not doing that many favours. Aye. Aye. Yeah, quite be honest with him and say, look, you just, you're not going to go any forward unless you're not going to go forward unless you change your attitude, you change your fitness, mm -hmm. you change your diet, you change your uh, whatever it may be. Aye. And they don't like to hear it, but I tell you what, I learned that they, they when you tell them on the honest truth, they, they, they say, okay, good, I'd rather have that than people telling me, oh, you were Aye. great tonight, okay, Aye. you're a wee bit overweight or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it, it took me a while to learn that because... It's difficult when you first start. Yeah, you would be to be able to say to a player, "Oh, by the way, you were you were shy tonight." Right. So you're in a situation, you know, you've got to learn, and it, 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 to be able to be honest with them, mm -hmm. it's, it's no easy. But once you know how to do that, that's Aye. a skill, believe it or not. No, hundred percent. Yeah, you're fine. You know. Aye, I always remember him. Always. Then obviously, when you get Gaza saying things like that, as well. Aye. Mental. Have you any memories of him? Because he was obviously about Scottish football for a few years and probably around a lot of your Rangers boys at the yeah, time as was, well. He was, but I, I, there's a, a funny story about, about Gadzer. I met Gadzer a way, way, way before he, uh, he did the day with Rangers. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you a wee story about him. I was travelling the world, believe it or not, before I was in football. Right. I'm one of those ones, right, I'm away myself. Aye. And I got off a plane in Fiji. This is to do with guys in case you think I'm wavering me. <laughs> <laughs> off a plane in Fiji in the taxi driver. says, oh, how are you doing? Fiji. I didn't even know how to spell it at the time, right? Where am I? Fiji. And we get off a plane and uh, myself. Aye. And the guy said to me, um, oh, you're here for the football? I said, uh, what football? Mm -hmm. He says, oh, Newcastle United are playing against Fiji national team. Right. Oh, yeah. That's good. I go in the bags, bounced Aye. up to the game. Right. Go to this game. There's about... 4,000 at the game. Mm. No many guys for uh, East End of Glasgow were there for sure. <laughs> and then there was a guy called, I always remember, he played at Watford, George Riley, and he shouted for the stand. He came off and, oh, how are you doing? So if he knew me. But it just so happened that the hotel I was staying in, the the Newcastle team were in. Oh, right, okay. Next thing I know, I'm sitting in this jacuzzi with all these Newcastle players. <laughs> like, what's that? You know, like, <laughs> but I wasn't in football at the time. I know Gaza was one of the players who was only 17. And he was like lively, mm -hmm. and I mean lively then. So anyhow, I remember they get beat for nothing. Right. And and Jack Charlton was the manager, and he came down and went, oh, you just get up the stairs. Oh, my guys was getting lit back. And I went, yeah, it's this wee guy. <laughs> anyhow, it stopped my mind. Then, of course, I became famous. I went, oh, I remember I met him in a jacuzzi. <laughs> blah, but nobody would believe me. Comes to Rangers, and then as soon as the man the first thing, I says, do you, remember, do you remember I met you in Fiji? Ah, uh, you're the big guy who was travelling the world for Glasgow. Eh? <laughs> Clever, with it, sharp <laughs> as a tack. Uh, so, and then he knew me as Charlie, he related that I was Charlie's agent, and mm -hmm. that's how he, even if I meet him a day, he just said, oh, you're the guy, the big guy that travelled the world, just Charlie's agent. You know those one of 50 players. He, <laughs> so he just relates to me with them. But one of the things about, you know, Gaza was such a really nice and generous people, you know, people are getting all the, all the bad sides that you're mm -hmm. seeing. I remember once we were in a in, in North Borough, mm -hmm. the place we used to drink on a Sunday afternoon, Aye. like the similar story I was saying Aye. before, and they were all sitting having a, a drink, and then and Gaza gets up. No, this guy came over and went, listen, don't want to interrupt these guys. He says, but I see, you know, I'm no into football. Mm -hmm. I know you play for Rangers. He says, Aye. but my dad's Rangers daft. He says, and Paul, you're his favourite player, Paul Gascoigne. He went, oh, thanks, mate. Da, da, da. So he, he said, would you mind signing an autograph? He said, oh, no problem. It's your dad's name, Joe, or whatever. Aye. And then Gazza's signed up. At, I seen him up at the bar signing, got the drinks, came down. Then about half an hour later, Gazza disappeared. And, and that's what he used to do anyway. You know, Aye. just like, you never Let's see Joe. go Chico. AWOL. AWOL. That was part of the trick. And then about two hours later, Gazza come bounding back into the pub. 
Everybody was like, where have you been? What happened? We thought you were AWOL. I know what he'd done. He went up at the bar to the guy and says, listen, where's your dad's day? He says, just nothing in Odinson. I just want to take me lang. When I lang at the guy's house, <laughs> an old guy about 70 odds, <laughs> sat in a cup of tea with him for two hours and came back. Uh, and uh, you could imagine that old guy. Why is he sitting here living room? Your boy comes back. Oh, I've got okay, Gaza with me. <laughs> I just brought something to see Jeez. you, Dad. So that's the story. That's the kind of thing that he used to do. A very, very decent, generous guy, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. That's mental. Um, what about... How was your relationships over the years with kind of chairman and managers? Now, you touched on Murray earlier, but there were some big hitters in Scottish football. Like through your period as an agent as well, but I'd imagine it must be an up and down relationship with chairman and managers as well, probably, but how is it for your point of view? You have to manage that because, you know, one week you're, you're maybe, you know, they're all over you because you're bringing a good player. Aye. And then, you know, sometimes after that, you, you may be falling out because they're no mm-hmm. wanting with your player or they're no returning calls or your or the player does something wrong. Right. And you and they're on to you as representing them. So it's something you have to manage. Mm-hmm. And for me, as long as you were straight with them, yeah, I got on no bad. Some I fell out with. Aye. Aye, aye, some, and you know, and then you get back and talk to them. But you know, most of them are okay. Mm-hmm. But you know, you, you're never everybody's pal. No, no, no. no. You're never ever. I've been in a situation where a, a club wanted, not one, but three or four clubs wanted one of my players and and then he goes to one of them, and the other three are saying, well, what happened there, John? Mm-hmm. What happened? How did we not get him? Aye. What's happening there? And you're having to appease them. Uh, and then the next time you're taking a player, I'm saying, ah, what happened with the last one? You let me down. Uh, but the player didn't want to go to your club at that time. Aye. So for me, I always gave the decisions to the players. So I've had I've had good relationships, and I've, I've, and I've, but I fell out with lots mm-hmm. of managers and uh, and chairmen. Uh, that, but that's part of that's part of the job. You can't be. No, everybody likes you. No, hundred percent. Any names that you you enjoyed working with, or you had kind of good balance with all the time. Martin O'Neill was a a, a <clears> straight <throat> guy. Uh, I liked to, I liked to work with him. He he was up and down in the way he operated, but a decent guy. I liked mm-hmm. him. If you're talking about Scotland, David Murray. Uh, David Murray is, is somebody that was very, very hard but fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he he put a lot of business my way in terms of helping me find a player and right. then a lot of work with him. He he was a good guy mm-hmm. and I liked the way he operated. Right. Cause a lot of clubs just now when you're going to do business, you're having to go through three or four different people to get the decision maker. You could just pick up the phone to him, phone to him and he'd say, I or no, or I'm in it. So it was quite straightforward, straight, quite straightforward with him. That's a couple of names that I always think, you know, mm-hmm. they're the type of old school ones that I, I liked. Uh, what I mean, Walter Smith was great as well. Aye. Walter Smith, when, when I very first started in the game, gave me a, a good bit of advice. Right. I always remember when I first started. Uh, and I was dealing with all these young boys at Rangers, and there was a few of them were a bit wayward. Mm-hmm. And he was guiding me through the job the job at the beginning. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. I met him uh, just before he died, uh, a year before he died in the street. Mm-hmm. And I was with my boy. Aye. Walter, how you doing? Oh, John, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. And he started asking me about where's this player, where's that player, and how's he doing? And I don't know what made me say this. My boy was with me. I said, listen, uh, this guy actually helped me when I started my career. Aye. He went, how did I help you, John? But he did. Right. He was like guiding me at the very beginning, you know, this is how you should do He actually uh, uh, guided me how to deal with David Murray at the beginning, you know. <laughs> he gave me the advice about how to talk to him and get into him because some people found it a little bit difficult. Aye. So, uh, uh, he was another really good guy. Always the same. Aye. Same wavelength the whole time. Mm-hmm. Never up there. Martin was up and down, and mm-hmm. but he was always like that and he always put me in the right direction. Aye. And I, I, I remember... When he passed, and it was something I, uh, I put out in public. And he really helped me. Aye. Love that. What about um, like your Sunni season, your Billy McNeils, and names <laughs> that would give me the fear as a young football <laughs> agent having to pick up the phone to yeah. either one of them? Graham Sunnis, man. Graham Sunnis and I went to watch uh, Craig Moore playing for the Who was Craig, 
Craig playing for at the time. We've done an Australian national game. Right. Chris says to him, look, this is who you should be signing. Obviously in Newcastle. He was a Newcastle right. manager. So Aye. him and I went to Craven Cottage together right. mm-hmm. to watch a game. And of course, one thing I learned about him that night was how uh, civil he was with all the fans. The fans mm-hmm. were coming up, Graham. I thought he was, I used to look at him as a big arrogant guy, right. you know, but stop pictures. Hello, how you doing, son? Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, I'd never noticed that part about Graham Soonish, you know, because you always look up as the, Aye. the, the terrifying the, the terrifying guy. Uh, and then we went for dinner after, and he's like, he said to me, I remember him saying to me, I'm not sure Craig's the right height, mm-hmm. you know. I said, but he can jump higher on that centre back or the other centre back. So we had a big debate. In a cut long story short, he signed, he mm-hmm. signed uh, Craig. And, uh, and Graham Soonish, another, another guy that through his career, has, I've dealt with, he's been, he's been decent. And Billy McNeil, when you mentioned him, what made you mention him? He he was one of the first guys when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I ran onto the pitch at Celtic Park. Right. You know, in the days when you could run on the pitch and you didn't, you didn't get done. And Billy McNeil said to me, "Hey son, off the pitch, come on." <laughs> and then I rem- and then I reminded him of when we went to do a, de- a deal with him. He was one. Of, he was up there one of my deals before he retired. And uh, I said, by the way, do you know that? We tried to deal with signing a player. Do you know that you chased me off the pitch one day? And he went, what are you talking about? And I told him the story. And he was a, a civil big guy. You know? So that's the big names that, if you we, are mentioning a the name, they were decent, decent people. Did you prefer it then when, like as you say, the chairman or the manager would just pick up the phone and be like, John, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z, mm-hmm. rather than going through 9, 10 director of football, yeah. as in, and you name it. Did you prefer 10, 10, that but- way of... Ten times better. Here's what I'm looking for. Can you get me it? Ten times better. Right. And uh, I appreciated when, you know, I phoned people when they, and they said to me, no, we don't like him, or, or listen, right. John, on your bike. Mm-hmm. I remember Alec Ferguson <laughs> said to me once, he said, John, see if you're ever going to give me a player, make sure he's a Man United uh, level. And I thought, well, maybe he gave me a, a bit of a ball, came back to my I went, he's right. Maybe he wasn't a Man United level. Several years later, I know that Man United are interested in this player that I've been I've been working with. And I'm dying to get back, <laughs> and I phoned them up and I went, "All right, what is it? What is it? Where have you got like that?" And I said, "What's this player?" And they went, "Oh, aye, aye. but I already knew that they fancied him. No, they didn't sign him. Aye. But that was me back to say, well, "I've got a player at Man United level." But the first time, to be fair, that was a learning process. Never go on your phone to somebody at that level when your player. Mm-hmm. Is not at the standard of the club, and I think I was trying it on that time with Man United. I think maybe I'll just wait to speak to Alec Ferguson at that time because it was a long time ago. Get the hairdryer time when it's <laughs> well to go away. No, on the phone, he just basically says, Look, he's not at your level. If you're going to phone me again, make sure the player you're, you're coming to me with is at that level. And that was fair. Yeah, right. I took that, I took that in the chin. It's a learning curve as well, isn't it? Definitely. Brilliant. Brilliant. I've got to ask you, and I've said, if you can't name names, that's fine, but have you had any memorable? Phone calls from chairman or managers or your clients they say you need to get a grip of him he's fucking out of control or was always getting into trouble or <laughs> oh jeez I've, I've had plenty of them you know the private ones like John what's happening here and I can't mention these I wouldn't want to do that <laughs> no fair to the players or even the owners but I've had that I've had it with not just in Scotland all over where mm-hmm. people saying look your guy's you know gone a bit, he's a bit wayward or he's not on the right track that was in the days when, when you know, you dealt with them, right, like, okay, leave that with me. And that's right. Nowadays, they would go to an HR guy who would go to this person who would go run, run the circles. I prefer Aye. them to just pick up the phone and say, your boy's no fat enough. You need, get, you need to catch a grip. Aye. I remember who, I can tell you who was very like that with Dick Abicat. Mm-hmm. He was direct. John, your player's no fit. Tell him, tell him that what we're saying here. I've told him twice. It's your job. You're his agent. You've got to pay good money for your club. Get it sorted. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> I liked it for I liked him for that. That's the way he operated. Aye. You know, you've been paid mm-hmm. to look after this player. He's not doing what he's not what he's what he's supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. We're doing part of it, but it's part of your job as well. Aye. And I think, well, that's as you know, and I like that directness. I suppose, but you must get that situation where players then are sold by these clubs and they don't realise how good an opportunity they had at the time. I've had that aye. until they they're then at another team and you're like Hell, I was at a big level there and I blew it. Gary, I met a guy talking about uh, a, a junior match about two or three years ago, maybe a bit longer than that. And he said, John, how are you doing? How are you doing? And I'm looking, I didn't, I didn't recognize him. I said, right. How are you doing? No, like, 
Right, who are you? You know, one of these things. He says, you don't recognise me, do you? You were my agent at Rangers. And then I realised it was a, a while ago, and there's a young guy who was who was a, a really good player mm -hmm. and Walter Smith and I were working on that same situation. Right. And he said to me, by the way, John, I didn't realise how good I was at, at that time. And he went, he went to, to there, to there, to there, to there. Aye. And he knew, 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 that's him saying to me, just talking to us at a game, I just didn't realise how good I was. But I remember Walter saying to me, John, see if this boy could get his head together. Aye. What a player. I'll have him in my first team within three months. But it didn't happen. You think that happens as much in the modern game as it did, with players kind of they like drinking that nah. and different things. So you think they're tuned in now? It's a different world. Right. Players don't go. Out and, I mean, everybody did at that time. It's not Aye. just Celtic or Rangers. No, All around the world, everybody went drinking in England. It's just not a culture anymore. Aye. I seen Gary Neville talking in something recently, and he was basically saying that they used to go after a game, it be Roy, uh, Roy Keane. And a Wednesday night they would go drink, and then aye. a Sunday after a Saturday night after the game they would go drink, and that was just part of the But no, that doesn't happen at all. No. Change days. Generally. What about obviously you're you're working with a lot of players who people love and people idolise and people look up to. Have you ever had points when you've been starstruck and you've met and a football player could be MD through your line of work? Well we that's a good question. And when you're connected to football players at the highest level, uh, then the, the football players are always related to, you know, like musicians and actors. Mm -hmm. And it, because I don't know how many guys you've interviewed or many people you know, but nearly every musician wants to be a football player. Aye. And actors want to be football players. Aye. Football players want to be musicians. <laughs> so they sort of a kick about Aye. together. But Tony, but as you're saying that, Tony, we've been starstruck. I remember I went to a uh, a nightclub in London mm -hmm. and I was going to meet our famous uh, guy here in Glasgow Frank McAvaney <laughs> who is in a nightclub in a nightclub <laughs> so Frank says look your name's at the door right yeah he, he, he says just tell him you're with me mm -hmm. you know because it's a difficult club to get right. in and that was with a Celtic player who was quite well known at the time right. so I was to trundle up at the door right the guy's like can I help you he says I uh, we're, we're, we're here. he went I said you know how you know him? He's like, no, who's he? Don't even know the Celtic player. Who was the player? It was a player called Derek White. You remember Derek oh, White? Aye, so aye, me, aye. So me and Derek got up the, up the, the, the guy like that. And Derek was at his high, he played for Scotland, and blah, blah, blah. Chased him. No, he wasn't letting us in. And then we said, excuse me, but we're friends of Frank McAvaney. And the bouncer just changed to it. Frank, well, you're friends of Frank's. Come in, come in. So, oh, boys, boys, Frank's, Frank's guests. Frank. And then he took us into this, and it was a big, massive nightclub. I go, how are we going to find them in here? He says, no, 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 you're not going there. There was a door that led up these stairs. Right. And it was like getting into a, a private living room. Right. There was a bar in, in the living room. And we walked in there, and I looked about, and Frank was not there anything. So we sat down. Hey, hey, big, big Derek went, look who's sitting at the end of the bar. Mm -hmm. I went, wait a minute. Elton John. I went, no chance. But about 20 minutes later, who came bounding into the room? Andrew Ridgely and George Michael. <laughs> what? He's like, there was one of the ones were going, that's so true, that's so true. But do you know who was the most famous at the mall by Country Mile? Frank. Frank bounced into the, the room. Him. They're all going, Frankie, Frankie, champagne, Frank, Frank. <laughs> and I'm like that. And I remember Mo Johnson was there that night right. as well. Uh, and Gordon Jury was there because he played for Spurs at the time. Right. So, I says to Derek, well, you should play for Celtic. I mean, I, I feel like a real <laughs> Wally here. I mean, all these guys are all famous. <laughs> and they, they were all coming up to it. And Frank said, hey, this is so-and-so. He introduced us to, no, right. Elton, but he introduced us to uh, uh, Andrew Ridgely and George Michael, who came down and sat with And they were all over Frank McIverney. But remember, at that time, Frank was the, uh, he was like the top man in, in, when he was playing at West Ham. He was like the kiddie. I don't know if you remember. I was having Tony Cote, wasn't yes. it? That was the... Aye. They nearly won the league through uh, Frank McAvenian. And see to this day, because remember, he went back to West Ham. Because I remember being at his uh, debut against Norwich. To this day, if you say to somebody in London that's over 50, and they're a West Ham supporter, 40 or 50, you say, oh, I, I know Frank. Oh, he's a king. Aye. If you go to a game with him, right, because he still goes to a lot of games, Aye. you know, and... The fans are all run about him. He's, he is like 
I could maybe describe him nearly as close as what the Henrik Larson situation Aye. is when, when, you know, if he appears back, you know, the King of Kings or whatever. Frank McAvenny is that icon. And what a, Gary, what a beautiful, cracking, down to earth guy he is. You always see on Twitter and all that, West Ham fans are always, always talking to him. See, when he posts something, it's like, Aye. legend status. I was in a taxi in London about two years ago and uh, I was with a guy and the guy says, I was meeting Frank the next day mm-hmm. in London and he says, I, I, I meet Frank, Frank McAvenny and more than I'm by Frank, and the taxi driver just went, Frank McAvenny, do you know Frank McAvenny? And I'm like, wow, Frank, Frank, Frank. There was all these stories about Frank McAvenny, you know. <laughs> His football career, obviously, then all the women and aye, all, the, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the great times he said. But all the time I've known Frank most of my life, he's just been the same down to earth, lovely guy. Aye. You know, and what a, what a character he is. He should write a book. Oh, I think he has. Yeah, I tell you, you can a do What's an old book? <laughs> 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 he should be doing a movie and running a book. I tell you what, if we had another few hours and we could uh, get a few listeners if we just spoke about him alone. Oh, I'd probably get cancelled. I'd probably get <laughs> shut down. <laughs> what, a, what a man. Um, I was going to ask you, obviously, with the, the Craig Muir situation where you've had a player who's became an agent, have you had any other players that went on to do kind of different stuff career wise? Or they've kind of went on and done stuff that you wouldn't necessarily thought that mm. they would go and do. Hey, we as as a as a company, part of your job is that we try to get them when they get to that, you know, thirty five and and the panic sets in. Hey, and it's We're a very day now. Yeah, it's a very difficult period because mm. it's not just about not just about the money. They want to be able to become a coach or get into mm-hmm. the industry or like Craig's became an agent. Aye. It's a difficult period, Gary, because one minute they're this famous guy, Aye. and then a couple of years later, who did he? Who did he play for Aye. again? And psychologically, a lot of them it's difficult to to deal with. So we try to break them into different different areas or jobs or whatever. But uh, one one interesting to you think say that one of my players, a really a, a boy that I looked after after since I was sixteen, a guy called Kevin McNaughton, mm-hmm. and went right through his career. He went from Aberdeen, then became the top man at uh, Cardiff through his full so career. Did. Aye. We got a testimonial for him, uh, which was one of the last testimonials. Lovely guy. Then one day he said to me, I'm, I'm, I'm finished and all that, and he was trying coaching, and then he tells me that he's, he's painting. Right. And I thought he meant painting houses. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he's painting, Kevin, what do you mean you're painting? He says, oh, you know, I, I used to do a wee bit when I was, you know, and I like painting. Mm-hmm. I said, what, what kind of painting? He said, well, it's mainly people I, I, I paint. The next thing he showed me his paintings, I went, Wow, and I took him down to a uh, uh, to London to meet a pal of mine who's actually a famous painter, right? Who actually painted the Queen, right? And I says, right, there's his paintings, Kevin. Two years old, we had a good chat, and, mm-hmm. and you've shown him. He says he's got a chance. So he's actually privately doing paintings, and they're mainly uh, of uh, ex footballers or uh, his ex players, and he, he sells them, you know, for big money or anything. Aye. But he's a painter, a professional painter. So uh, random. See if you see that, it's super oh, random. So when he says to me, I'm a painter, I'm like, oh, you're not, what, what kind of building say you own? And I, <laughs> he says, no, I paint people. <laughs> so, then another one that's quite interesting is a big Marvin Andrews. Aye. Who is, you know, very religious, mm-hmm. if you know anything about Marvin. And Marvin's now a pastor. He's actually in a that's church. Right, if you want to go and see big Marvin out in Fife, he went to his church. I went to see him on a Saturday afternoon. Aye. It was weird when we all his gear on and doing the doing the spiel. Aye. Uh, and he is a, he's another another a very interesting, lovely, lovely man. Mm-hmm. I remember when he, he was at Rangers. I took him to Rangers, and we, he didn't even know I went to meet him. They, they knew that Rangers wanted to sign him, and and they, he didn't even ask me the club or the money. Right. He said to me, "I'm going to wait. He pray to God to see if this is the right move for me." I would, do you know why I know the club? Before he knew it, I, at all. he was at Livingston. And I'm like, I'm here to tell him, you're going to Aye. a massive club. He says, I don't know why I know the club, John. Just let me go and speak to my, you know, my his pastor at mm-hmm. the time, or his mentor, and I want to pray to God. And a couple of days later, he hadn't come back, and I picked up the phone. I said, hey, has a big man told you yet? What's <laughs> happening here? Has a big man upstairs told you what's happening? Somebody get this deal done. Aye. He says, I... I, I, I'm meeting my pastor tomorrow as well, he says, and we're going to talk about it. He still didn't know. Right. Then I told him, he says, 
I, I think I'm ready to go. And then I went to meet him and told him Rangers and he took it in stride and we obviously done okay for Rangers and he's a, a bit of a legend or an icon. Aye. I always remember the the cruciate yes. injury and he refused to get the surgery. He says God will, will heal him. Aye, but he played the full season. And he played in the World Cup. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> I, I met him in the world. I went to meet him in the World Cup, and I'm like, you, you can't be playing. He's like, I'm going to play me. I'm like, but you only had the injury a couple of months Aye. ago. And he says, God will heal it for me. I mean, everybody talks about this in football. This isn't a, 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 he's like, a, a, and it healed. And he's still today playing football. Now, I don't know what age he is. He's still playing like legs like tree trunks. Oh, yeah. By the way, massive. Fit, fit, fit guy. He was introduced to me with wee Russell Lappy, who I took to Rangers. Right. I, I just spoke to him last week, actually, for right. the first time in ages. He's went to be assistant manager in uh, to Dwight York in Australia. He probably falls into that. If he applied himself, he would have been a player. nowhere near Scottish football. Oh, what a player, man. Unbelievable. I remember going to see Rangers Livingston, and he was in the starting lineup, and he never appeared. And then after a the game, McLeish said he'd slip in, and then he turned up to <laughs> quarter to three. So laid back. the <laughs> game. Talking about people talking about your players. Big Alec phoned me one day, he says, John, have you read the Daily Record today? I said, what is it? I don't know what's happened. He said, just go and read it and go and come back to me, please, eh? So I opened up and there's Russell. You, Russell. <laughs> who's laid back. He's like, like see, if you met me, Russell, you, could, you, you, would, you would love him. He just, he's, hey, man, well, you know what's, <laughs> what's happening? You know? I did a sleep in for the game. Right, so laid back. Horizontal. Anywho, he's done an interview. Somebody's asked me to do an interview. Any problems? And he said, in the interview, you know, I don't mind having a fag and a beer every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because my granddad told me that's good for me, you know, something along the lines. <laughs> and then uh, Alec, I says, Alec, it's just be Russell. He wasn't mean, he doesn't go and get 10 pints aye, every day. Aye. He has a wee cigarette now and again and a beer. But he made it, it way it looked as if he was out in the razzle every day. But, you know, it's it, it just because I, I phoned him, I went, hey, what's wrong with that? I've read the story. There's nothing wrong. I'll speak to Alec. I said, but you can't be coming out with any type of story. <laughs> <laughs> I, in fact, I mentioned that to him when I spoke to him last week. I said, remember that? And he went off. He says, ah, yeah, it's a wee bit, it was a wee bit off the wall. Which is, but John, that's, that's just him. That was Russell. Aye. Very different from Marvin. Aye. <laughs> Very different players big, there. Big, big Marvin didn't drink. Uh, um, totally big Marvin was a big, you know, big, strong bruiser. Mm -hmm. I think he was more of a, a ball player. Uh, and the two of them played together. So it was Russell introducing me to Big Marvin, and then Big Marvin became a pastor. So very interesting. You can still go and see him in Fife just now. But how? What I really love about, about Big Marvin was he uh, he got offered a job when he was at Wraith Rovers mm -hmm. in England. I got a call. We love him. Reading Football Club going to pay him a lot of money. Right. And he says, "No, I'm staying here because I want to be a pastor." And I'm talking. 20 times what he was earning at Rose Rovers. Maybe he's earning that. Knocked it back. I couldn't believe it. No one of the ones. I'm like, hold on, Ma hold on Marvin. That's kind of be right. Because I remember I was sitting with somebody. Aye. I said, say that again. You're, they'll let you go free. I, they said, I can leave anytime. Mm -hmm. I said, this is a championship. They're offering you X amounts. And he went, John, he says, I, I, I really appreciate you've got me that job. He says, but I have to tell you, I'm learning to be a pastor and I want to stay here in Fife. And I went, Right, okay. I remember sitting a couple of mates. I went, I don't know if I've just, I've never heard that in my life. Aye. But hats off to him. That's where, that's where he wanted to go with the rest of his life. And he could have been playing in a championship rather than Rafe Rovers at the time. For a lot more money. I don't know just think how much. I know how much it was. It was uh, 20 times what he was earning. Think about that. And he knocked it back. And then I, and then I met him years after and he said to me, um, John, this is what my, my life's about becoming a pastor. He says, mm -hmm. if I had a move to there, I don't know what would happen. Another time with Marvin, because I, 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 I love talking about the big man, you know, you should get him on your show. Aye. But he, uh, uh, all he would do is laugh. He just laughs and sings. I don't know if you've seen him. He, uh, I've sing. seen him at the football a couple of times. He's random. Uh, he, he, gets, he, he had a, a thing every Friday morning where he says, hey, it's Friday morning again. He'd put it on Facebook and he'd sing a song going to wherever he was going. <laughs> And he just smiles the whole that time. He's happy. He just a happy, happy big, big guy. And then I remember he came to Rangers, and I think it was Nike or Adidas gave me a big, massive box of stuff from like, mm -hmm. you know, um, track suits and shoes and right. all the gear. It was, must have been worth about a grand or something. And it was, I, I, I was 
I go to pick, I picked him up at Ibrox and uh, I took him out to Ernestine. At that time, I was involved with a pub in there. And he says, Me, John, go and bring that box in. And I took it into, into the pub. I thought he was to, to look the rummy through. Right. He says, Get that to the boys in the pub. He says, he says, he says, he says I, I, they need it more than me. Never seen that in my life before either. Normally, every player's like, oh, What's in there? What aye, size are aye. they? Oh, many t shirts, or many tracksuits. Oh, only three tracksuits. He's like, Get that, you other guys. So, of course, in that pub, for the next day, uh, for the next period, everybody's running about in brand new tracks. <laughs> <laughs> Shoes that don't fit them, the trainers. That's so random for you though, because your job is to try and get players better deals, and then you've got a player going, no, I don't want it. I'm no, all right, I'm just going to stay here. Then they went, didn't just give it, uh, oh, that, that's it, yes, and that was like, that's the only time that's ever happened to me. That was a shock. That took me days to go, I, I phoned them back a couple of days, I went, I wonder if he's been smoking marijuana or something. Hello, big man, what is it? It's just about that, they all, you know, they're asking me mm-hmm. again. I says, John, I, it's, that's a definite no. Then I knew then it was all over. It's only ever happened to me. That's only ever happened to me once in my whole career. I was going to say, it can't be something that happens a lot. Because if it, you come to any player and go, you're getting 20 times your wage, you're like, right, we're away. Let, let's go. Wild. Is there... I know when you were on before, we spoke about when you were in Brazil and the, you'd Kaka and Rubinho and... You never got them. Is there any other players that have that have had a, a decent level that you've missed out on? There's, there's been a few. There's, there's been not, not more than a few because mm-hmm. in this game you talk to a lot of players to try and sign them up to uh, to take them on board. But I I can't think about any bigger than to anyway. That's for sure. Aye, that's a. <laughs> still to this day, we still, huge. we still talk about that to this day. Any uh, in British football that you've? Uh, not really, not really. There's some that we've came close to in British football where, where we've interviewed them to try and take them on board. That's no work. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, that happens because sometimes a, 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 a player becomes available and there's maybe four or five agents trying to sign them up. Right. But uh, uh, not really. Mm-hmm. Billy Gilmore. I went to meet Billy, uh, young Billy, a mm-hmm. couple of times. And he decided to go work with somebody in London. Right. Uh, which happens, a bigger agency, bigger name. I uh, That's probably one of the ones when I see him playing, you know. Aye. I was down in his house in Salcoats a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I knew he was a good player for watching him for 14. Aye. You get that buzz about some players that uh, age, don't a, you? He's a player. And then mm-hmm. like, when he got to the age, I've been able to sign him up. I went and met his parents. Lovely parents. Mm-hmm. Great grounding. Uh, but somebody in London... Came, came, became involved. And that's what happens in this Aye. business. It's, you know, you get to players and other, you get in competition. Some mm-hmm. you win, some you lose. Aye. Lots okay. of players that I've signed that other agents didn't get. Aye. And they were Aye, sitting saying that we bass violas go. But that's the game we're in. Swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Yeah. What about any deals that you've made yourself over your career? What ones have stuck out for you? I know, Christian Carambu taking him to uh, uh, Middlesbrough. That's one that always sticks out because because his wife is so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times I, I think I told you that in the last podcast. Uh, the did. amount of people who said to me, "Oh, John, how is uh, Christian's wife doing?" <laughs> no, how's Christian doing? <laughs> uh, I still get that. <laughs> Christian's now the uh, sporting director at Olympiacos. A great job, but I don't ask about that. No. Uh, I tell you another another one that really always sticks out with me is uh, coming back to Kevin McNaughton. And Kevin McNaughton, we thought I took him to re-sign a contract, mm-hmm. and it was all over the press that Cardiff were looked as though they were going to go into liquidation. So he didn't even know if he was going to get a job. Right. And and he waited in the restaurant in the hotel next door, having in to do the deal. And uh, it was one of those ones I was thinking. If I keep him at the same money, I'm mm-hmm. happy. But it just so happened that the guy that just started in the job was didn't know much about football, right? And he uh, and he was, I think he was from a rugby background or something, chief executive, and he never really came up across a an agent so much. And I thought, well, wait, no, I'm in here, I think, you know. Mm-hmm. And they, we went. I think it was at the time three grand or something. Right. And then I said to Kevin, I says, look, see, we got up to four or five and I got a decent contract, I'll be happy. Mm-hmm. And I never get so much pleasure in my life when I go uh, when I go to the club to mm-hmm. buy 13 grand. 13 grand. Be a starter or a free. <laughs> and I tell, you, I, tell you, I tell you how that came about was because the manager was a guy called Dave Jones who loved Kevin. Aye. And Dave phoned 
just happened to phone uh, when I was in the meeting right. like, to this new chief executive who was didn't really know where he was going. Mm -hmm. And and the new chief executive was like, ah, all right, okay, yeah, right, okay. And what Dave said is, look, no matter what you do, keep that player. Mm -hmm. Because for me to re-sign a player like him will cost me a million quid. Aye. So you need to keep Aye. him. So the budget means... You know, you pay them what, they're, what they're looking for. Aye. Otherwise, we're going to have to pay a million pounds. Right, you get somebody else. And pay them 10 grand a week. Aye. Or whatever it may Aye. be. So it made sense. Mm -hmm. But when I heard, when the guy came off the phone and went, oh, that was Dave, the manager. He says, you know, he really loves you. He's got you've got to keep you. I was like, oh, right. <laughs> we're in. But the pleasure I got out of that was when I went back to meet Kevin. Mm -hmm. They went, so what's happened to the man? Did I get a contract? I said, Three years, four years or something. Mm -hmm. Much. Four. Brilliant wee man. I said, no, higher. But higher than four? Five. Higher. And I've never seen a guy with some, mainly doing cartwheels up and down the restaurant. <laughs> hey, <Anna. laughs> and uh, uh, and he's another guy, as I've seen, that we've, who we've worked with off the over career. Uh, but, but solid boy, you mm -hmm. know. But it made sense for Cardiff to sign him because he's just say, they're going to have to pay a lot Aye. of money for a, a right back at that time. He was an international right back. Uh, he was a, We've been a there a long time, I know. Stalwart at the at the club, so that's one of the. It's the pleasure you get. Ah, you doing the it. player saying, "Wow, you've done your job Aye. for me correctly Aye. here," and that, that's that's a job satisfaction. Because when I'm telling you people who are coming into this business, it's not all about the money. It's mm -hmm. about seeing that player at age sixteen taking them on board, seeing them getting the debut. Say this the last time. Not just the debut, I'm scoring a goal and you're part of that journey. Mm -hmm. Then they become the captain, then they won a cup, then they're playing for the national team. And you're at all those games and Aye. you're part of that journey. Mm -hmm. The money will come. Mm -hmm. Like the boy I said earlier, if you work really hard at the business Aye. and you stick by your player and you work hard with him and he does what he's got to do. Because mm -hmm. remember, that you're in the, they're in your hands. Aye. They've got to do the job. Aye. Then the money comes. Aye. And that's what I try to tell new people coming into the business. Mm -hmm. Don't go for the big buck right away. Go looking to help the players. And if you've got three or four in the team and only one of them makes it, those other three will still tell people you've done the job right. Aye. And that'll get you more business. And then when these players go through their journey of their career, you'll feel part. And that's a job satisfaction Aye. part, which is immense. It must be hard now for a player as well, because there is there's so many people moving into that industry to work out. What agents are the best ones? Who who do you trust? Who do you not trust? As much as it's a minefield for yourself trying to find players, it must be the other way as it well is. for a player to find an agent that they can trust. Because if you've never if you've never had an agent before, you don't really know where to look for. And if you've never had a relationship with any of these people, you don't really know who to trust. Either it's a kind of it's a hard battle on both sides. It's funny, it's funny you say that. I seen a thing on YouTube of all places mm -hmm. uh, about six months ago, and it was about American guy, right? About showing young players how they should choose an agent mm -hmm. and hit this he was on his third agent right and he went he was telling you you know what you should be doing what you should be looking for what are the red flags uh and how he's moved twice but he thinks he's made the right agent now and he's mm -hmm. made mistakes and it was really really interesting right but for me when when these guys are coming uh to sign up you know i'll say to them right bring your parents mm -hmm. if you're old enough bring your pal, bring a lawyer, bring somebody else to get a second opinion. Right. And go and meet two or three different agents, you mm -hmm. know. Go and, I'd, I'd welcome them to do that. Because right. for me, if they don't want to deal with me, uh, go and get yourself a good agent, you know, because I believe everybody should have a good agent. Right. I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, so it is difficult for them mm -hmm. because there's some that just sign anything right away because right. they get a big excited because an agent wants them. Mm -hmm. But I would say to them, go and do your due diligence, make sure like, the people have got the right connections, make right. sure they're background's right uh, and for me if you do if you go through that period of doing the diligence it, will, it should come good but you, you've got it right a lot of them they don't uh, they just sign so they've got to try and work out who's uh, it's a minefield because you get a, a lot of people will throw money at kids as well same yours in like in africa and south america and places like that and you kids might be jumping that money but then a year down the line they're in a hell of a position well, they could have just waited and got somebody that was right for them and that's you for the rest of your career. I found I found uh, players who should have went to a different level, but I've only exactly what you said have stayed because I've chose the wrong agent Aye. for the wrong reason. It might be they've got a uh, they've got something from somebody from family or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that guy's not got the connections to take them 
out of where they are. Aye. And it happens a lot in Africa. We were doing a Ghana quite a lot just before lockdown. And uh, a lot of agents sign up with other African agents because they get a thousand pounds, which is massive to the Aye. family. That guy can't kind of take them to Europe because he's no pathway, mm -hmm. no connections. Mm -hmm. So they get stuck, but they don't know that at the time. Aye. So you're right, it is unfortunate because they don't understand. They think, oh, this guy's giving his money, a thousand pounds, a lot of money to a family or Aye. to the kid himself. Aye. But that guy has not got the wherewithal no. to move him to Europe or to take him out of the country. Aye. And that happens all over, especially in Africa. And scam agents, you know, the yeah. ones that come to you and say, I've got you a club, mm -hmm. you pay me $1,000. Aye, then you and don't they, see them again. Don't see them again. It's happened. That the amount of emails I get, mm -hmm. or the amount of people who say, this has happened to my son. Aye. We have sold part of our land. Or we are, it's horrible, and it is rife, especially in Africa. Insane. That is insane. Um... <laughs> question that I had in for somebody uh, asking me if he can talk about any bizarre or random situations that his players have ended up in and one of my players who uh, who own a wee bit of a wee bit of a random situation <clears throat> wasn't he playing for the first team and he woke up in uh, it wasn't Amsterdam where was it it was somewhere like that because mm -hmm. him and his mates went out Right. And, and then the and the manager saying to me, where is he? I didn't know where he was. And needless to say, he was in another country because he'd been on a razzle with his mates and he had to make up a big excuse. I've had that before. That was a while ago. Uh, in bizarre situations, they all getting but a lot of them have got in, in in bizarre situations, but none that come to really mind right away. But that's one I remember years ago. Where are you? Uh, uh, no, where are you? It's a long tone. I can hear. Aye. You're not here. <laughs> and he. Uh, and he's like, eh, eh, eh. I said, look, just tell me the manager's been on the phone. Where right. are you? He told me. And I think it might have been Paris or Amsterdam or something. <laughs> How, what are you doing there? You're supposed to be at training. And he's saying, eh, ah, well, I went out with my mates and eh, we all decided to jump on a plane. <laughs> I'm like, you're a football player, man. You're, you're training. <laughs> That's all right for them. That maybe you can get away with what you're, this is your career. Aye, I know, I know, I know. I'm stupid, stupid. It covers for me. I'm going to try and help me. Just <laughs> I subsequently I told the manager the truth because I knew this particular manager Aye. would would actually not find it funny, but I said to him, look, give him a wee break. You know, just a young boy and he's been caught up in the wrong situation. That's what <laughs> So that was a wee bit bizarre. <laughs> oh, mate. Um, it's been brilliant. Again, it's been brilliant to pick your brains. For anybody curious, and there has been a few people sent in messages asking about it, how can they sign up for the courses? What's the detail for people registering? Uh, yeah, it's under our we've got a separate business called uh, John Jeweler Academy, which is an academy for teaching people mm -hmm. how to become football agents, and that's a uh, jvacademy.co.uk. Cool. Get all the detail for there. They'll, they'll get all the they'll see all the ugly pictures of me and my partner Phil McTaggart, and uh, all the stories about you know how to become a, a successful football agent. But it has worked for a lot of people mm. worldwide. You just got to work hard. But yeah, but don't be telling your wife that you'll be home at five o'clock, that's for sure. <laughs> or your girlfriend, or you'll not be in the pub with your mates, that's for sure. <laughs> While they're all sitting on a Friday night having a pint, you're out watching kids playing football, or you're travelling to China, or, or whatever. So don't think it's a get-rich-quick scheme, <laughs> that's for sure. Brilliant, mate. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Cheers, Enjoyed bud. it. Brilliant. Thanks.